This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Claire Chambers, who teaches political philosophy at Cambridge University. Is also the author of uh, a number of books. The most recent book is called Intact, um, A Defense of the Unmodified Body. Uh, also got a couple other books, um, one called Against Marriage, uh, an egalitarian defense of the marriage free state and this one here is sex culture and justice the limits of choice welcome claire thank you so much for having me and thank you for holding up my book so beautifully yeah well, well i think you know it was in this book sex culture and justice that you you articulated this uh, tension between uh, universal liberal values and the notion of social construction right you, you know i think most people who consider themselves, I guess, university educated intellectuals would subscribe to both of these notions, but they, they don't fully appreciate the extent to which they are in, in tension. And so they will frequently propound, you know, ideas and policies which are, you know, somewhat, somewhat muddled or they find themselves, right, uh, um, you know, articulating things that, that, um, that are difficult to defend. Um, and so I, I was wondering, I, I think we can start there and, and dig into this. You know, I'm, I'm trained as an economist and, um, you know, we're all utilitarians for the most part. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I know you've spent time at the law school, the law and economics movement, which is, you know, built, I think, fundamentally on the, on the harm principle, um, is, is similar to economics in, in that they, they both kind of take preferences as, as given, right? They sort of say, well, you know, people just are created <laughs> out of thin air and and they just start off with these these preferences and they don't give a whole lot of thought to kind of where these preferences come from and so um without a, a coherent theory about where preferences come from then you know utilitarianism winds up oftentimes getting into these tensions between, you know, oh, are we trying to satisfy current preferences or long-term preferences or, you know, and we, and we have to think about other regarding preferences and, and, and uh, interactions and so forth. So, you know, I guess maybe we could start by asking, you know, why do people, I guess, gloss over the tensions between these two seemingly reasonable positions? Okay, great. That's a great question to start. Thank you. So yes, the two positions are one that our, our choices are socially constructed, right? There's a sense in which the context that we live in, the culture, the society we live in shapes or affects the, the choices we make and the preferences we have. Uh, the other position is that our choices and our preferences ought to be really significant when we're thinking about whether it's the justice or the, the rightness or the, the best thing to do of some kind of action or some arrangement. And the reason these two are in tension is because, as I put it in Sex, Culture and Justice, if our choices are socially constructed, it doesn't make sense to use those choices as the final arbiter of whether our social context is just. Right? We choose from within that context. And so the things we choose within a context are naturally going to be responding to that context. You asked me not to describe the contrast, but to say why people don't get it. And I think the reason people don't get it, perhaps, is because you know, we really want to feel that our choices are authentic and that they are ours and they are significant. And so when I'm making this argument about the, the kind of clash between social construction and choice understood as a very strong, what I call normative transformer, something that can make an outcome right or just or acceptable just by its presence. Um, the reason that I make that argument is I make that argument in a way that contrasts with a kind of false consciousness argument. So perhaps we're, we're, we're familiar with a kind of false consciousness argument coming traditionally from Marxist thought that says, you know, if we are constructed or in Marxist terms, you know, subject to the grip of an ideology, then the things we choose to do will be distorted by that ideology. They'll be false. We won't understand the true meaning of our actions. And that's very unappealing um, mm -hmm. to those of us who want to feel that we have some you know, assessment of our situation, that we have some critical perspective, we have some ability to understand and analyze and step back from our, from our culture. So I don't make this argument in terms of false consciousness. The argument is not that people are irrational, or people are unable to, um, you know, make good choices because they are, they're distorted or under some sort of grip of ideology that they can't escape from. That's not the argument. The argument is rather that we choose within our context. We choose from options that are 
made available to us, um, that are made appropriate for us, and the payoffs are structured for us by our social context. And so we can be choosing as well as possible, as rationally as possible, as consciously as possible, um, and yet still be in the grip of that social context. So there's a room for an external critique beyond what we, we are choosing. Yeah, and I think that the book Intact flows directly from uh, sex, culture, and justice. At the beginning of the sex, culture, and justice book, you you highlight this this contrast between, right, this rogue doctor who was doing cosmetic uh, injections, which led to all sorts of health consequences, and um, you know people who uh, were wearing high heels and getting bunion surgery and so forth. And you know we I think would think that the in the former case, right, this is clearly criminal activity and the people who are making the choice to get these crazy modifications were, um, you know, should be protected. But on the other hand, we, we see people who are, you know, going in and, and walking in and getting voluntary, you know, foot surgery so that they can uh, uphold the standard of beauty. You know, we, we don't we don't think that there should be any interference there. And, and I think at, at the beginning of the intact book or somewhere in the intact book, you also had this wonderful pairing of, um, you know, Senegalese women who will sometimes undergo uh, gen genital mutilation. And, and you know, we look at them and we think, this is horrible. You know, these women need to be protected. But when the Senegalese women look at Americans who are getting breast augmentation, th they look at that as being, you know, barbaric in, in the same way that, you know, we see female gen genital mutilation. So, um, I mean... When, when you throw those things up as contrasts, I, I think, you know, a lot of people don't know how to respond, right? And, and even people, you know, feminists uh, who are, uh, you know, the community of philosophers that you spend a lot of time engaging with, right? They, they don't know how to re respond. Um, I, f I found this decentering or, you know, perspective taking, you know, profoundly insightful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, what I try and do with those contrasts is... I mean, sometimes, as you say, with the example of the Senegalese women and the American women, that's a kind of cross-cultural contrast, right? Where we think about mm -hmm. our judgments of cultures that are not our own and how they can compare with what we judge within our own culture. Sometimes the contrasts are within practices that do occur within our culture. So in Intact, I have lots of examples of cases where, um, you know, we tend to have completely different views about different kinds of procedures, where actually if you drill down into the logic behind them, they're, they're quite similar. So one of the discussions that I have a whole chapter devoted to um, takes on this case of female genital mutilation, as it's called in law, female genital cutting, as it's called by some um, theorists, um, which is almost universally understood to be wrongful and is illegal in many countries, including some of the countries where it's most frequently practiced. Um, and the case of male circumcision, routine male circumcision, where, um, you know, in, say, in the USA, that's understood as a, not only an acceptable, but actually a normal practice. The majority of, of newborn baby boys undergo circumcision. And so I think in drawing these contrasts, whether they're across cultures, within cultures, cultures, uh, um, different practices that we engage in for beauty and so on, what I'm always trying to do is ask the reader to think about whether the reaction of critique that we want to impose on a practice that we don't engage in, you know, should be turned in on a practice that we do engage in, um, or whether the, the direction should be the other way around, um, and that we should actually think that all these practices are fine. And I think that, the, that that's a kind of quite a useful way of understanding the impact of, of culture on our choices, because we can see that practices that seem familiar to us tend to seem... Um, unproblematic and practices that are unfamiliar to us tend to seem much more difficult. So there are all kinds of examples in the in the case of, sort of bodily integrity and, and cosmetic procedures which are like this. I mean, I, I like the fact that you brought in the example from the very beginning of sex culture and justice, which is the case of this fraudulent surgeon who injected women with substances that were not clinically approved. They were sort of engine oil and industrial substances and so on. So there was that deception. When I wrote that book, the use of um, skin fillers, lip fillers and so on generally was pretty uncommon, certainly in the, in the UK. Um, now it's completely ubiquitous. So I think even that case would have a different uh, valence to a reader now who would think, oh, I know all about lip fillers, I know all about Botox, I know all about these cosmetic procedures we have on the high street and generally they're, they're fine. Whereas when I wrote that, I think for a 
the audience that I was writing for, those procedures were, you know, seemed really extreme. So things change very rapidly as well. Well, I mean, you, you could tell an entire history of political philosophy uh, through the kind of nomos fusis debate, right? <laughs> and, and I think you, um, you know, you talk about this uh, fraught relationship that feminism has with, with nature, right? So on, on the mm. one hand, mm. right, um, the, the, the natural has been used as a, a way to keep uh, women oppressed, right, uh, mm. by saying that they are uh, inferior because of their nature. But on the other hand, right, feminism has to be grounded in, in the body, to some degree, how how is um, how is this tension kind of played out, and you know how does feminism at the current moment think about its relationship with nature? So the first part of intact is devoted to this concept of, of nature and the natural body and what that might mean, um, and I really think of nature, the concept of nature, as being firstly highly confused philosophically. Right. So when we think about what mm-hmm. we mean by nature, if we trying to do the philosophy of what counts as natural, um, we get a highly confused set of practices. Um, but also the politics of nature are really significant, and that's what you've brought out in your question. So when we call something natural, we tend to mean that it is good, or at least that it's not bad. Um, so if you think of the example of, you know, we talk about natural medicine, right? But we mm-hmm. don't talk about natural disease. So that is not a kind of formulation that we would use. So both medicine and disease, health and disease can be natural in the sense of sort of coming, you know, not being created by humans. But we, we tend to use the natural um, adjective only for those things that we think of as being good. So that's why nature has been used so efficiently and effectively to denigrate women and to subordinate women, because by describing women's inferiority as natural, right, that gives an impression that it's, it is both good, it is um, uh, something to be protected and gives it a sense of inevitability. So feminists have had over decades, over centuries actually, had to refute that idea that women are naturally inferior. And that has often led feminists to say that the, the very idea of women's nature is, is suspect as a concept. Mm-hmm. So John Stuart Mill famously um, put this by saying, how we, could we have any idea of what women's nature is when we have always lived in a society which has these very strong gender norms. He doesn't use the phrase gender norms, but that's what he's talking about. So there's been this very strong need within feminism to rebut and reject ideas of of nature because they've generally been used to subordinate women and to justify women's subordination. But another equally strong um, theme within feminism has been to think about the significance of embodiment and to say that there is a significant and meaningful and sort of valuable aspect to embodiment which a kind of male focused culture tends to ignore or tends to focus only on on the male experience of embodiment and so these strands of feminism talk about the need to understand the significant and distinctive value and experience of um, menstruation childbirth gestation breastfeeding menopause to bring the woman's body back into into focus and again this is something that has been a feature of feminism throughout its history thinking about what it means to have embodiment at the center of an understanding of of, of politics really they come into tension clearly you can see straight away because if we're thinking about bodies and embodiment we tend to be invoking ideas of nature um, that there's a sense in which an embodied uh, feminism is a sort of natural feminism, so eco-feminism, which calls very strongly on the idea of the significance and power of the female body is sort of the, the culmination of that idea. Um, and the idea that the body shouldn't be determining our social status, our preferences, our political rights, and so on. So there's a clear tension there. I think at the current moment, you see this most obviously in the case of debates over gender identity and trans rights. Um, and I think that we can see precisely why this is such a difficult issue for feminism because both sides of what has become an increasingly toxic debate appeal to claims that feminists want to endorse, right? So the idea that gender should be a matter of identity and not a matter of the body, that trans people should have full and equal rights and status to people who are not trans and should be treated as if they were not trans at the same in the same way, that fundamentally appeals to the feminist idea that the body shouldn't determine our status, the body shouldn't determine our rights, there's no natural 
status to, to womanhood that you know signals who should be politically subordinated. So it appeals very strongly to that. But the alternative view that there should be something significant about you know the body you were born with, um, call it biological sex, call it sex assigned at birth, call it maleness, femaleness, you know, there are different ways of expressing this idea, that that should have some significance and that has some explanation to people's political status and moreover that the ways of being embodied you know, have significance in thinking about politics, that's again an equally strong part of feminism. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why but it's been such a difficult thing to, to solve. And I think it was it was in tact you started with this this great story. It was about this TV show, and and I think I remember seeing a version of this TV show, right? Where this 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 the, I think the version that I saw the episode that I saw there was this young girl who was born with a birth defect, uh, sort of I think it was a you know port wine stain or something on her face, and um and uh, and the you know the TV cameras came in and and they said oh look how horrible it is and look how you know much she suffers and look at all the abuse and bullying that she gets and. And then, you know, they whisk her away and they, they give her some plastic surgery for free. And, um, you know, she's not allowed to see her family until the whole thing is healed. And then when she emerges and they have this big to da in front of the audience and she comes out and they reveal her new face without the wine stain. And her parents are like, oh, now she's beautiful, right? And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so horrible, right? <laughs> like, this is so horrible that their parents are, are saying that now she's, she's beautiful, right? Which means that mm. I guess they didn't think she was beautiful before. But, you know, it's, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's hard to, like, it, it would be hard to imagine a world where you would make it illegal, let's say, for a, a girl to go and, and get that kind of of, of surgery, although I think you discuss that as an option. It's, it's hard to imagine that because we want to alleviate suffering. Mm. But I mean, the cause of the suffering is twofold, right? I mean, it's, and you point this out, right? I mean, th there's, there's the, 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 there's the, the physical characteristics that she has, and then there is the, the social reaction. Mm -hmm. And so are we addressing the, the physical and trying to fix, quote, fix or adjust mm -hmm. or modify the, the physical because we, we just simply think that it's too hard to, to change the, the social, right, to, to get rid of the mm -hmm. bullying, right, to change social norms, to get people, to get society to, to, to view that as un, unproblematic? Um, I mean, why do we default to changing the physical or modifying the body rather than modifying the, the, the social perspective that we take on these different types of bodies? Okay, that's such a big question. There are so many different ways of answering it. And, and let me start with, with this way, which is to say at the level of the individual, when the individual is facing um, the question of how to, you know, to live a livable life, it may be the case that for some individuals, modifying the body is the best solution, is the solution that would be the most effective. And I take great care in intact to, to, to say that and to say that the mm -hmm. conclusion of my book is not to say that any person does something wrong if they modify their body and that it would be wrong from a philosophical or, or sort of ethical standpoint to say that individuals have a duty to refrain from modification. It may well be the case that for some individuals, that is just the best way of, of living a, a life that is, that is flourishing. So that's the first thing to say. But then if we take, come back from that question of what an individual might decide to do, we then do have to think about what we collectively as a society do. And shows like the one that you just described, that I talk about in intact, clearly contribute to that idea that it is not only sometimes, as it were, the, the last resort that we should modify the body, but that that's the, the, the best thing to do. That's the ideal thing to do. That's the first yeah. resort, almost. And that is a deeply, deeply damaging uh, message to give. But it's a message that we give to each other, to ourselves, everywhere we look. And that's the, one of the fundamental claims of Intact, that the message that your body is not good enough is absolutely ubiquitous we receive that on every level about almost every body part so each of us has a different personal history with our bodies each of us has a different sort of understanding of our, our, how our bodies fit into our into our culture but in co talking to people about the arguments for intact what i have really clearly seen is that everybody has a part of their body or an aspect of their embodied experience that they feel 
anxious about and often ashamed of that shame is about the body is just a deep and ubiquitous phenomenon and it's actually so deep that I think if we feel we don't have that shame we feel shame as well there's a sense we expect people to have shame about their bodies so the way I put this is you know if I were to say to you which I won't I don't want you to answer this question but if I were to say to you Greg you know what part of your body are you most ashamed of or you would you most like to change you know my guess is you would have an answer but if you didn't have an answer and you said nothing you know everything about me is great then I think many of us listening to you would think, well, that's pretty arrogant. That's pretty complacent. You know, surely there's something you want to change because we expect that of each other. We expect us to want to improve ourselves and we expect each other to feel a sense of, you know, permanent inadequacy in some sense. And that's so corrosive and so damaging and actually not just damaging from a sort of individual mental health, psychological well-being point of view. It's a real severe public health Mm. issue. Because anxiety and shame about our bodies is in itself the cause of you know, significant mental health problems. And it just also contributes to a situation in which there is an economic incentive for um, companies to develop and market products which both create and then claim to solve appearance anxiety. There is an incentive for us individually to undertake um, modification activities or practices which are are bad for us that have bad side effects or risks and there's a whole host of behaviors that many of us do to try to alleviate the shame that we feel about our bodies which again are you know cause significant distress so it's a serious problem it's something we do at a social level all the time um so there is that question about how we can collectively come to disrupt the idea that solving the body is the right way to deal with these problems well, I mean, I, I, I would ha- I would have trouble answering that question, right? And 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 I think um, you know that my friends and family would say that's why I'm unmarried because I don't <laughs> spend enough time, right? uh, quote, curing my baldness and and so forth, right? I mean, but isn't a lot of this driven by finance and financial gain? I mean, you can't go down the street without seeing ads for different types of body modification, right? And, and I think even though the, the pressure to modify one's body is felt more strongly by women in yeah. contemporary America, um, you know, it's not limited to women, right? I mean, you spent a whole chapter talking about bodybuilding, which I found fascinating. And, and I've, I've read some other books on, on bodybuilding. And I think in, in today's Instagram world, I think, you know, everybody feels this pressure. But but I, 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 I love the fact that you dig also into the kind of medical aspects of things because I think most people don't give it a whole lot of thought when they are exposed to medical terminology. But, but you know, medical terminology is socially constructed. Right? Our whole notion of, 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 you know, health is to some degree, not completely, of course, we can't go that extreme, is, is socially constructed. So when I, just when I see the term, you know, cure your baldness, I think, well, wait, why are they even allowed to use the word cure, right, right? When, yeah. when, when they're talking about something like that, right? Since when, I mean, w- w- since when is that a, a, a pathology, right? I don't, um, do, do you think we just sort of casually accept the, this, this language and is this language driven by financial gain? Well, the, 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 the line between health and you know, non-health is as I have a, a chapter t- talking about you know, it's a very um, contingent line there's some great examples of this one example I think that is really uh, just illustrates this so well is um, orthodontics right cosmetic mm-hmm. dentistry yeah. so I think in the US and actually increasingly in the UK it's just a completely normal and accepted thing that it, you know in the teenage years or at some point people will have braces to quotes correct um, teeth which which quotes, need braces, right? And that's a fundamentally accepted practice. It's understood as healthcare. I think in the US it's covered by health insurance, generally speaking. In the UK, um, where we have a different way of of funding healthcare, you know, there's a significant amount of orthodontics that the National Health Service will provide. Uh, And this goes well beyond what is needed to ensure, you know, adequate functioning. And it's basically about cosmetics and the idea that uh, having teeth that are not of a particular perfect uniformity is Mm -hmm. a a kind of a a health problem so that creep about what counts as health and what doesn't count as as health is um 
is there. And there's also the extent to which we think that if we do something for health reasons, it's a different kind of motivation. So yeah. one thing that lots of people have said to me about the arguments in Intact, or when they, they kind of hear about them and they haven't read the book, is they say, well, presumably there's a really important difference between going to the gym for health reasons and going to the gym because I want to look yeah. a certain way. Like the bodybuilder is doing something very different than the person who's trying to keep fit. And I think it's very um, sort of, familiar and easy to think that there's a really strong distinction there and when I started writing the book and researching the book I thought I was going to make a kind of clearer distinction than I did and I soon really realized that that distinction was simply not going to to work because the line between um, modifications for health modifications for appearance is incredibly blurred I give lots of examples in intact and the question of what motivates us is also often just simply not yeah open to us you know do we really know why we are doing something and i think you're absolutely right to, to say that economics and commercial gain is fundamentally part of this um, and it's not merely in the case where you know clinicians and surgeons can charge for surgery or for orthodontics or whatever it's also you know way, the way we can medicalize beauty procedures so um, there's a kind of blurred line between whether a cosmetic procedure is something that has to be done by a beautician or, or, or a clinician. So what are the, we talked earlier about uh, facial fillers and Botox and lip fillers and all this kind of thing. Um, and very often there's a sort of assumption that practitioners of those kind of procedures will have some kind of clinical qualification, but that's simply not the case, right? So they're often done in a kind of apparently clinical setting with a white coat and, and so on, but they're, they're not clinically regulated. They're not clinically um, qualified uh, practitioners so that blurring of the line between health and appearance is is itself marketized so i mean in in this section on surgery you talk about kind of clinical modification cosmetic modification and, and cultural modification and yeah you know if i go to to the dentist uh and they say hey you know you know we we, we can straighten your teeth you know, and, and I remember, I'll, I'll always ask this question, like, is that is that a, a, a medical recommendation or is that a cosmetic r recommendation, <laughs> right? And, you know, they, they, they have trouble responding to that question. I, I think it's because they don't get that question very often. And, and in America, mm -hmm. I think it boils down to if you get reimbursed by your insurance, then it's, it's medical, which is a yeah. bit, you know, it's a bit circular, right, at some point. Uh, yes. and, but, but, um, you know, I think that I walk in there thinking that there is this very clear distinction, but I think part of what you're arguing is that, you know, the, the distinction is, is, is a tough one to make. But the one thing you do say is that, you know, all cosmetic surgery is, is cultural surgery. Yes. Uh, so could you dig into that? So what's the, first of all, what's the, tell us the distinction between cultural, you know, motivations and cosmetic motivations and, you know, why are all cosmetic mo motivations really cultural motivations? Sure, yeah. So this discussion comes in the context of the discussion about various forms of, of genital cutting that we touched on earlier. So let's think about secular routine male circumcision. We can think about religiously motivated uh, male circumcision. And we can think about female genital mutilation. And we can think about but wait, lady uh, it's, it's, right? But it is, interesting, it is just interesting in the language. Like we call it circumcision rather than, you know, male genital mutilation. Right? I mean, why, yes, why, why don't we say, hey, would you like... You know, would you like your kid to get some uh, male g genetic mutilation, right? I mean, I think people, if they heard that, they would, they would, they would have a, you know, second thoughts, I think. Absolutely. And there are activists, anti-circumcision activists, who do use that terminology. And, and the terminology about around female genital mutilation is also very controversial and contentious. And some people think it should be called female genital cutting as a more neutral term, which then mm -hmm. we can I interrogate. The reason I use the term FG, female genital mutilation or FGM is simply because... That is the term used in the in the the in the law of the countries that I'm discussing, um, but I'm open to the thought that we should call it female genital cutting and male genital cutting, um, you know, as a kind of comparison. But but most I think most people will understand the terms FGM circumcision as being kind of familiar terms. So if we think about how we understand those different practices, so cosmetic labiaplasty, FGM secular male circumcision, religious male circumcision, right? It's tempting to think that these are really different kinds of practices because we might say, well, the motivation for um, labiaplasty is, is cosmetic. The motivation for um, 
the, the religious circumcision and perhaps the FGM is a religious culture, cultural um, identity based motivation. Um, the motivation for um, secular circumcision, that's often ex- described as being motivated by he- either health reasons, uh, mainly health reasons, but also kind of with a connection to cosmetics. So I talk in the in the book about the American Association of Pediatricians who talk about the having a having a penis that looks like other men's is a is a valuable thing to, to have and so on. But of course the reason that I say that cosmetic uh, procedures are cultural procedures is because what is deemed cosmetically beautiful or normal is determined by our culture. Right? Whether we think it is more attractive to have or not have a, circum- a circumcised penis depends on the culture and the historical moment that we that we live in. So, you know, there are studies that show that in the U.S., where circumcision is routine, um, the majority of uh, Americans think that a circumcised penis is more attractive than an uncircumcised penis. In the U.K., there's just no generally understood correlation between the foreskin and the attractiveness of the penis. It's just not. A- <laughs> It's not really a phenomenon that is is part of our, our, our kind of understanding of penile attractiveness, if you can put it that way. Um, in other cultures, like in ancient Greece, the longer the foreskin, the better, right? So that question of whether a foreskin is, is beautiful is clearly cultural. So then when we're thinking about whether a, a procedure is culturally accepted, then the cosmetics are part of that question. There's not a kind of um, previous answer or, or determination of whether... Um, an appearance is one to be targeted or one to be rejected. I mean, to take another example, um, a relatively recent cosmetic procedure is, is butt implants, right, to make the, the, the bum, the buttocks look larger. It's not too long ago I can remember that it was cosmetically desirable to have a small bottom mm-hmm. and that, you know, that you would want to, you know, does my bum look big in this? So that would be the question yeah. why you would want to have but it's, but it's, so. but it's kind of like, it's just kind of like narrow ties and, and, and thick ties, right? You know, there used to be the big ties are in fashion and, you know, narrow ties are in right. fashion. Uh, but, you know, I think that this seems fun- fundamentally different, right? I mean, adornment, I guess there's a continuum, right, between uh, adornment and, and body modification. Um, is, does it make sense to draw a line between the two, right? I mean, mm. because you, just as you feel pressure to be dressed in the latest styles, right, mm. you now feel pressure to sculpt your body according to, to, to the latest styles. And now, you know, buying a new nose might cost about the same as buying a new handbag, so, I mean, is, would the argument against body modification also spill over into, right, arguments against um, trend following and, and, and fashion? And, you know, same with hair, right? Hairstyles. Right. People spend an enormous amount of time on, on, on hairstyles. Is, and, and, you know, I guess some people would make the distinction that there's, you know, reversibility and irreversibility. But, yeah. I mean, look at Orlan, right? She's changed her face a thousand times right so so even that is 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 now becoming re- reversible D- is there is there a distinction here between you know the the body and 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 the adornment of the body yeah so i mean you know look i'm a philosopher so we we love distinctions there are many different distinctions we can make and some of them ha- are more salient than others in different contexts right so you talk about reversibility and irreversibility and that certainly is a distinction that matters right if we're contemplating doing something to our bodies or, or, or in life generally, right? That's irreversible. Then generally, we should have a higher standard of uh, of caution about an irreversible decision than a reversible one. That's just good good sense. Um, risk is also another clearly important distinction, right? So the risks of side effects or things going wrong tend to be greater for modifications of the body than for adornment, right? The risk if I buy a new handbag and I don't like it any longer is I've wasted my money. Um, the risk. I think you said a nose job would be the equivalent, right? If I buy a new nose and the surgery goes wrong, then that could be very, very serious in terms of my, my health and future well, well-being. So there are, there are questions of risk which tend to be different with adornment and with body modification. Um, I think a further salient difference is to do with the way we understand our bodies as being you know, fundamentally different to adorning those bodies, to... to, to to, to props or accessories or fashion trends, uh, you know, fundamentally our bodies are, are us, right? We are our bodies and we invest our identity 
in our bodies. We understand that our identity should reflect or be reflected in our bodies. There's a very close connection um, between them. Um, we tend to take on shame about our bodies in a way that, again, we don't know about material things. So, you know, if I'm wearing some outfit and you criticize my outfit for not being in trend, well, you know, that's going to be upsetting. It might, I might feel humiliated. I might go home and, you know, never wear this outfit again. And it, you know, it might be a, a very unkind thing to do that has an impact on me. That's going to be a very different kind of impact than if you tell me that my body is in some sense wrong and that I ought to change it. I'm going to internalize that much more deeply and feel that as much more closely an attack on, on me as a person rather than the choice I made to wear this particular outfit. So I think adornment can have many of the similar features to body modification. As you say, it's about trend, it's about social context, it's about feeling we have to look a certain way to give a certain image. Um, and in Intact, I talk about examples like hair and makeup and the way they are part of this picture. Um, but I do think they are—they have these these significant differences. And I think at some point you said that you know the demand to be normal is in mm. fundamental conflict with the norm of equality. Um, well, I mean, it's interesting that, that you know we, as a society, particularly here in America now, I mean, we we increasingly emphasize equality, um, and I think we increasingly emphasize tolerance and tolerance of difference. Um, but at the same time, you know, we see these trends towards you know, more and more pressure to be, quote, quote, normal. Um, as an historian, I'm always wary of any kind of, <laughs> you know, claims that, you know, I, I say, wait, let's look, you know, wait 300 years to figure out which way the trend is going. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, are, are, can both of these trends be, could be operating at the same time? I mean, you know, the, the pressure to be normal becoming more intense and at the same time we have, uh, stronger norm of equality. I mean, I think those yeah. those seem in conflict. So I think the reason that they are in conflict is because this idea of what counts as normal is taking what I call in intact a kind of external perspective, right? That what is to be normal is generally understood to be to be like others, mm -hmm. right? So when we think about whether um, I am normal, whether my body is normal, whether I am doing things in a, that a normal person would do, I, I'm kind of comparing myself to others. And the reason that is intention with equality is because that's not necessarily a comparative standard. It's implying we have to be the same to have an equal status. And it's failing to reflect the ways in which we are going to be fundamentally different from each other in ways that are not in principle uh, changeable, nor, nor is it desirable that we do that. The way I think we ought to think about normal that can be compatible with this conception of equality is thinking about normal from an internal perspective, right? Thinking about what is normal for me. And what is normal for me is very different than what is normal about me compared with others. So the way I discuss this in the book is through um, the example of disability. Uh, and somebody who has a disability from birth, you know, from an external perspective, that person is not normal i want to put scare quotes right around that normal they are not normal because they are unlike other people they are they are distinct they are different from an internal perspective that person with that disability from birth is absolutely normal this is how they have always been there is no other way they are that's a, a perfectly normal body to be in and a normal experience to have now this doesn't mean that we are always normal from an internal perspective right we uh, we, we, I want to say we normally, <laughs> we commonly um, experience significant disruptions in our bodies that make them seem abnormal to us. So perhaps the most uh, um, common experience, this is puberty, right? When we enter into puberty, our bodies are no longer normal from the internal perspective. They no longer feel like us. They do things they didn't do before. They look ways they didn't look before. You know, if you're, uh, if you're, voice breaks, you don't sound the way you sounded before. Um, so that disruption of puberty is a place where we do not we do not any longer feel normal from an internal perspective. Of course, it's perfectly normal from an external perspective yeah. to go through puberty, right? These come apart. And there are many other times when a disruption in our experience disrupts that sense of normality. So maybe it's something like pregnancy or, or aging or an accident or illness that changes how our body is from our point of view. So trying to kind of allow our bodies to be normal 
uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. They, our bodies change and we have to come to terms with them and re-inhabit them anew each time we are faced with this disruption. Um, but it's that allowing our bodies to be normal that I think is and can be compatible with equality rather than thinking that they must be normal in the sense of being like other bodies. Right. And I love, I mean, you, you dig into this distinction between impairment and, and disability, right? Where impairment is um, describing something to do with the body, whereas disability is really describing the society, right? And the mismatch between the, the individual who is impaired and the, the way society makes it possible for people to, to live. Um, and so, you know, we, we asked, you asked the question, well, why aren't, you know, men considered disabled because they can't get pregnant, <laughs> right? Right. Um, and, and so, you know, you could presumably shrink the comparison set to a size that would make everybody, quote, normal, right? So if, you're, if your comparison set is just you, right? I mean, if, you know, if you're deaf, then you say, well, that's, you know, you could be a normal deaf person, just mm -hmm. like you could be a normal male. But if we shrink the, the size of the comparison set to one, then, you know, everybody is, is, is normal. Um, but then that would sort of throw away the whole concept of, of impairment, which I don't think you want to do, because if everybody's normal, regardless of how impaired you are, then it's hard to come up with any justification for why we ought to come up with, say, cures or come up with um, technologies for, for helping people to, you know, achieve greater, greater possibility. Um, so, I mean, why, why, why can't we simultaneously tell people or get people to, to feel normal while at the same time offering them opportunities mm -hmm. to, to modify or to quote, you know, improve? Um, why is it that if, you know, it seems like we as, as a society have a difficult time giving options without simultaneously offering encouragement to take advantage of those options, right? So in other words, right. offering, yeah. if, we, if we offer somebody, okay, look, body modifications, are, for instance, in the, say, um, uh, you know, gender reassignment surgery, right? Mm. You know, I don't think we would want to foreclose the possibility of that for people who are, you know, clearly need it for for whatever reason, but you know why? Why the minute we seem the minute we make it available, it's like now all of a sudden we need to you know advertise it. And we need right. to like you know re reward it and reimburse it and like you know encourage it. Why can't why can't we simultaneously say you know you're perfect as you are, mm -hmm. but you know there is still the the possibility of of making changes. There's there's a lot there. One thing I want to pick up on is that you use that concept of cure, which Earlier in our discussion, you know, you said yeah. that you didn't like the idea of curing baldness, right? Why yeah. is baldness something we should cure? And it's, exactly. I think it's important to note that for many disabled people, that language of cure in the context of disability mm -hmm. is similarly, you know, problematic, right? So the, the mm -hmm. distinction between disability and impairment is a feature of the social model of disability, which has been a profoundly important part of both disability theory and activism since about the 1970s, which says, yeah, that's how the body is. That's impairment, so the body may be impaired in, in some way. But then it only becomes a disability if we do something socially that makes it hard to get around in the world with that body. So the most obvious example would be um, if you're somebody who needs a wheelchair to assist mobility, that becomes a disability when you live in a country with stairs everywhere. Right? Mm -hmm. If everybody used a, a wheelchair, there'd, there'd be no stairs and there'd be no problem. So just like we are not disabled by the fact that we can't fly, um, so similarly, you know, the disability comes from what the society does, not, not from the body. Now, that means that the language of cure mm -hmm. is already looking really problematic there because it suggests that what we should do is just change the body and that solves the problem. But where really, of course, many bodies simply cannot be, quotes, cured. They cannot be turned to some idealized state. The body is its own limitation for all of us. There are things that our bodies just will never be like and can never do. And so the language of kind of cure suggests we, we just need to somehow get rid of this problematic body and then we'll have fixed the problem. Whereas actually what we need to do is, is deal with, with the social context. So then you said, but why, why can't we do a bit of both? 
Why can't we both recognize that there are changes we can make to bodies sometimes that improve flourishing and well-being without making that be a kind of normative claim that bodies should be changed? Well, why can't we do that? I don't know. Perhaps it's because we over overreach, we overstate what we're trying to do. Um, perhaps it's because we just have a very difficult time with recognizing certain kinds of difference and valuing certain kinds of, of difference. Um, I mean, yeah, the question of why we do that is a very, is a very, very difficult one. Could it be otherwise? Perhaps it could be otherwise, but I, I suppose to return us to what we had at the very beginning of our conversation when we talked about the language of choice, right? I don't think that we solve the problem merely by saying, well, we just offer you these options and you just choose the one you want. If you mm -hmm. choose to have this procedure, that's just great. That's, that's great for you. Because while we should respect people's choices, and I, it's not part of my argument to say that we should prevent people from making choices that are about their own bodies, you know, we do have to recognize that we choose from what we are offered. In the case of the body, I think it's also really important to notice that there are two different things that we might be trying to achieve when we change our bodies. So one thing that we're trying to achieve is that our bodies are different, right? That's the most straightforward thing. Mm -hmm. If I go to a cosmetic surgeon and ask for a, a facelift, I want my face to look different at the end. But really, probably what I'm trying to achieve fu more fundamentally is I'm trying to achieve a difference in how I feel. I'm trying to feel better about myself. I'm trying to feel more yeah. confident, feel more at ease, feel more beautiful, feel more normal, whatever it might be. And, you know, we have really good evidence about whether cosmetic procedures, surgical procedures, body modification practices will change the body, right? A surgeon or a practitioner can give you a pretty good idea about whether or not your body will look different at the end of what they're offering. We have very little evidence about the psychological benefit um, because there simply aren't the long-term follow-up studies really in any of these areas certainly in cosmetic um, surgery is the area I know, know the best we just don't have long-term studies of people's psychological well-being um, and whether cosmetic surgery actually makes people feel better in the medium to long term we just have no idea we just don't know so surgeons can offer procedures which satisfy the body looking different but whether they satisfy the feelings, you know, we, we just don't know. And there's no guarantee that it's not an evidence based um, solution to that problem. So we're mixing a lot of things up, I think, when we mm -hmm. offer choices for body modification. Yeah, now I remember um, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, I used, to, I used to wear a suit and tie a lot. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, some of my colleagues would, would not wear the, the, the suit and tie. And, and they said, you know, how can you wear that tie? I mean, isn't that uncomfortable? And I remember saying, well, you know, actually, I feel less comfortable, you know, without it. Right. And, right. and, and so, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be, I mean, we, we all want to, to think that there's a sort of a, a natural state of comfort, but I mean, it seems like you cannot escape, right. The social construction when it comes to figuring out what makes you, you comfortable. And so at, th at that stage, it then becomes, well, okay, do we want to support a norm you know, where you have to wear a tie to be comfortable, or do we want to support a norm where you have to not wear a tie to, 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 to be comfortable? Um, and, and so, you know, how do we, what, what, what standard can we fall back on then? I mean, because we don't, if we, if we, we can't just simply say, well, you know, dress any way you like right. and whatever makes you comfortable because that ignores the, 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 the social pressure, right. That is inevitably there that helps shape those, those preferences. So, I mean, well, a, lot, we, a lot of what, we, what we're doing with dress is precisely trying to fit into a social context, and that, exactly. that is not always bad in any sense, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm invited to somebody's formal event, let's say a wedding or um, you know, something like that, right, and I turn up in my casual clothing, and it's not a casual wedding, and, I've, you know, and I just turn up in jeans and a T-shirt, and I should have been dressed up in a you know, smart outfit, I, ha I have done something wrong, right? I have mm -hmm. failed to conform to the social expectations of this event, I've failed to show due respect to the people who've made the invitation and I've sort of failed to celebrate with them in the way that I ought to if I'm going to this event. So, you know, we use our clothes as one of the ways in which we show our participation in an endorsement of our community's values. And that's in itself perfectly fine. You know, we dress differently for work or for an interview, for, for a job interview than we do for the beach, unless, you know, unless our work is 
being a lifeguard or something, right? And that's perfectly fine. So you say you used to feel more comfortable in a tie. My guess is you didn't feel more comfortable in a tie everywhere. Um, <laughs> but there were certain circumstances where that right. was, you know, you felt you were portraying the appropriate professional or, you know, or sartorial standards for that, for that context. So again, I wouldn't want to say that we should all just wear whatever we want at every occasion and there should be no reason for, for different standards of dress. Similarly, the idea that it can be good to make an effort with our appearance sometimes, you know, that's not a bad idea either. The idea that, you know, I've, I've put in effort to look nice for this, this important occasion. Right? That's something that is, again, a valuable social practice. The problem comes when that kind of looking nice, putting effort in is expected of us all the time, mm -hmm. where failure to do it adequately is seen as a deep sort of personal failing. And where actually it's never possible to do it adequately because there's always something wrong with our bodies. And that, I think, is the situation that characterizes a lot of um, the contemporary experience. Right. So I guess the, the problem would arise where if, you know, if I felt ugly or incomplete or inadequate when I wasn't wearing a particular style of dress. Because, right? you know, you talk about makeup and, you know, one could argue, oh, well, you know, there are going to be social social settings where you're, you're expected to, to wear, wear makeup. But, you know, you describe how there are people that simply cannot envision themselves, you know, walking around without wearing makeup. Or the motivation for wearing the makeup is is not simply to, you know, adhere to a convention. And they know that it's a convention, yeah. right? So, you know, where at what point does, does it become un undesirable? And, and you also talk about how, you know, when it comes to say wearing a suit maybe everybody is in an equal position where they can simply go and get a suit right at the off the shelf but when it comes to things like hair i mean if, if the convention is that you are supposed to have straight hair well this is you know easier for some people than others right absolutely yeah this is something that is expressed really well by the philosopher heather widows in her book perfect me so she describes a kind of global standard of beauty that has developed where um, there is an increasingly homogenized standard, particularly for women's bodies. Um, uh, and it has various features, which is about a certain kind of skin tone, not too light, not too dark, mm. a certain kind of smoothness of skin without wrinkles, a certain kind of body shape where you're supposed to be slim, but with curves. So, you know, there's a certain um, ideal of that. Hair, absolutely a fundamentally kind of um, uh, racialized standard of hair and so on. And, and the way that Heather Widows talks about this is she says, look, you know, people from a variety of different ethnic backgrounds and body types can achieve some of these standards. They come more easily to some people than others, but nobody can achieve all of them. They're kind of in contrast with each other. Everybody is deficient in some way. Um, and that's what makes this sort of globalized beauty standard so powerful commercially, because there's always something more you can do. And although we do have, um, you know, different conceptions of beauty, we have different images and different ideals of, uh, you know, what, what people can be like and still be beautiful. Typically, they are within those fairly constrained contexts. Mm -hmm. So again, the way that, that Heather Widows puts it is she says, look, you know, it can be acceptable to deviate from this standard in perhaps one of the areas, but not in all of the areas at once. So, you know, there are examples of, let's say, models who have a larger body size than is the sort of the standard uh, norm, but they will still be expected to have very smooth skin without wrinkles, to have a certain sort of skin color and hair and so on and so forth. So um, that is to say, yeah, there are things that we can do to our bodies which you know, aren't particularly sort of difficult to do. They aren't particularly traumatic to do or expensive or costly to do. What's kind of problematic and costly is this sense that there would never be an adequate body to have achieved. Yeah. Now, you, you described there's a story in the book where um, there was a, a guy who, who received some burns on his face and so was mm -hmm. disfigured. And uh, you mentioned that when he would travel to countries like India, nobody would pay him any mind or <laughs> notice him or pay attention to him. But when he would, you know, come back to America, everyone l looked at him and, and, and stared at him. And so he felt the pressure to, you know, get plastic surgery to, you know, be, quote, more normal. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it seems it does seem like this pressure to 
modified does it's it's not simply a matter of difference i mean there is a matter of degree as well and and if we were to track this the the, the pressure you know is that pressure becoming more intense with uh, say social media i mean I, i've seen people who've had their faces surgically altered to get what what's called like instagram face right mm -hmm. because you know the 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 lenses and the and the 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 filters you know don't work as soon as you step outside right and right. so you have to you have to get like a you know surgical uh, filter or or lens and 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 i guess you know for me i, I i'm just i i i start staring at that right whereas i think they're doing it because they want to they want to fit in with that instagram world but as soon as they step out of the instagram world at least in, into my world they they look they look somewhat freakish right but, um but I think you know th there may come a day where that would be the the new norm, right? Um, there's so a, there, yeah, there's, there's an enormous impact of, of social media and, and visual culture. I mean, you know, I'm old enough to remember the days when if you wanted to see a photograph of yourself, you had to make sure that you know someone took a camera with them and you posed for the picture, and then you had to finish the entire film, and then you had to send the film away to be developed and so on, right? So you, you, you know, having a photograph of yourself was 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 a big deal. Um, of course, now we can see and take hundreds of photographs of ourselves every single day and see them instantly. So there's that there's that kind of constant visual feedback of our own appearance that we have now, which is completely unprecedented, I think, in human history. I mean, you and I now, we're recording this podcast using software that shows each of us what we ourselves are looking like while we're talking, right? And that's a very recent development. So I did not know what I looked like. No, 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 fil no filters here. I got, I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't know what I looked like talking in a work meeting before COVID. Right? Uh -huh. If I was in a work meeting, I was in a room with people looking at them. Um, now, if I'm in a, on a Zoom meeting or a conference call of some kind, I can see my own face and I see what I look like when I'm talking mm -hmm. about the work business. And again, that's a fundamental shift. It's something that is again, unprecedented. Um, so there's that simple fact that we are, we are faced with our own appearance so much more frequently uh, and instantly than in the past. But then you also bring in, of course, the fact that it's not just our own appearance as it really is. It's you know, the filtered appearance. It's the, the ranked appearance, the appearance that we can put on a social media platform and have people like or dislike or comment on. So we have this idea that not only can our bodies be changed, but that our image can be changed and our image has to meet a certain standard. You know, so it's very routine now for us to take not one photograph, but, you know, multiple photographs and choose the best one. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, we couldn't do that in the days before um, digital photography, where, you know, that's the photograph of you at the beach. It's just this one, the one that you took. Maybe add a finger in front of the lens, and maybe it was blurry. But no, now we keep retaking the photograph until we get the one that we that we want. And so the question of how that image of ourselves, which is so filtered, both in the sense of using a you know photographic filter, but also you know chosen and, and ranked and decided mm -hmm. upon and selected, the relationship between that photograph and our real selves is very opaque. You know, if I take a picture of myself and I put lots of filters on it and I put it on a social media site and all my friends like it, are they liking actually how I look? You know, do I actually feel better when I have 100 friends like my photograph? Or do I actually feel, well, they liked that photograph, but that photograph isn't how I look and so I feel worse about myself now. Um, and this, I think, is an area that it's just going to become more and more and more significant, that question mm -hmm. of the relationship between our, 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 our embodied selves and our virtual selves, um, and how we feel that our identity relates to those two different beings. Now, I think the, the book is, uh, I think at some point you, you really describe it as a, as a call for resistance, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 uh, it's telling people to resist the pressure towards m body modification, right, to some degree. Is is this something that can be done through through culture, right? Or does it require some institutional changes, right? I mean, you know, you've spent a lot of time around lawyers, so you know, and I'm a lawyer, and and I always think, right? You know, are there legal changes? Are there changes, institutional changes? Are there things that we need to do with this, say the NHS and reimbursements and so forth? Or is it? Yeah. 
is this something that could be done at the level of culture? And, and, I, and I guess the second question is, you know, how can, as an individual, it's, it's pretty hard to do. Like if you think about a parent, you know, you tell your kid, oh, you know, you're normal, you're great, you're beautiful. I mean, that, that just ignore all the bullies and ignore all the pressure and don't pay attention to it. I mean, that's sort of what, you know, that's the education I received from my parents was just, you know, just ignore all that static and so forth. But, but that's, that's, that's almost impossible to do. It's, it's a bit of a, unless all the other people in that community are subscribing to this same philosophy of resistance, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to, to do that, right? Absolutely. Okay, good. So the question of resistance is really important. So yes, it, my, my argument is a call for resistance. To some extent, it's a call for resistance to body modification practices, but it's more fundamentally a call for resistance to the idea that your body is never good enough. So the, the, the subtitle of Intact is A Defense of the Unmodified Body. And I say in the book, look, the unmodified body here is not meant to be a literal thing. It's not meant to be a body that you've never done anything to. Right? You've never cut your hair. You've never moisturized your skin. No, no, that's not the idea. The unmodified body is the body that is allowed to be good enough just as it is. However it is, whether that is you know, with tattoos or without tattoos, whether it's with an impairment or without and so on and so forth. Um, now, letting the body be good enough just as it is is in one way a very, very simple, sort of modest claim. But actually, it's really radical and very, very difficult to do. It's very, very difficult to sort of quiet the voice in the head that says, yeah, this body isn't good enough and this body needs to be changed. And in fact, the body positivity movement, which tries to do some of this, which tries to say, you know, love your body, whatever your body is like, can actually be a cause of, a cause of additional shame the sense that you know i don't love my body enough you know so my body is not good enough and i feel bad that i don't love it enough and so again it's some layers and layers of of shame around the body so what i really am trying to do is take encourage people to take a step back from that while recognizing that doing that is incredibly difficult and is a political move <laughs> that is absolutely countercultural right and i certainly don't wouldn't say that i have succeeded in you know, always allowing my body to be good enough just as it is. It's a constant, constant cultural message that that is not the right way of thinking about the body. So there's a kind of sense of collective action against that sense that the body is permanently inadequate, is what I'm calling for. Now, you said, what about law? Can the law do anything? Yeah, there are some legal measures that can be helpful here, and I talk about some of them in the book. Um, there are areas of... Um, let's say, you know, clinical practice or, or um, cosmetic practice where greater regulation is needed. There are areas where the law can perhaps get involved in thinking about regulating advertising and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that earlier, how are people allowed to say, use the phrase a cure for, for boldness? Well, maybe there are things to do there. Um, in, the, in the UK context, um, there have been moves to thinking about when regulating advertising um, thinking about the impact of body image and appearance anxiety in regulating advertising as being one of the things that advertisers have to take on board. So there are things that can be done in the legal context. Uh, another legal change that's happened very recently here in the UK um, is that um, it is very recently has become um, against the law to do uh, Botox and fillers mm -hmm. on children under the age of 18 unless in the context of multidisciplinary healthcare, so there can be some cases where it's appropriate, but just as a cosmetic procedure, it's no longer lawful. So there's some examples of, of changes. But then, of course, the big, big issue is culture. As you say, what do other people in your community do? What is the feeling in, in your community about how to speak to children about these things? And, you know, I am not an expert on how to speak to children, I have children of my own, but I wouldn't say I'm expert in how to do it. But I think that there are two things that are, are that are key here. One is, as it were, not to bring bodies into things when they don't need to be brought in, right? To try to avoid comments about the body, to try to avoid comments about, oh, you look great, you've lost weight, or I shouldn't eat this because it's so bad for me, or you know, to try to avoid that constant commentary on the body that we'll do so um, so easily. But also, on the other side, to, to actually talk to children about body image 
and about the fact that it is completely um, usual and common for all of us, particularly children, particularly children going through puberty, to feel bad about our bodies. Partly because our bodies change and we have to come to terms with that, but partly because our society, our economics, our culture are set up in such a way as to try to make us feel bad about our bodies all the time. Mm -hmm. And so if you're feeling bad about your body as a, as a kid, that's something that is part of life. That's something that is, doesn't mean that your body is wrong. It's something to sort of recognize and notice, but try to try to move, move past. I mean, the way I put this in the book is I say, look, you know, if everybody feels bad about their bodies, it's not the bodies that are the problem. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, something, it's something else. Um, and I think it can be really helpful also for parents to have an understanding of some of the sort of stages of child development um, and the way that children relate differently to their bodies at different stages. So I remember um, talking to a, a friend of mine who was a psychologist of appearance um, and who told me that when children are around six or seven years old, it's an absolutely normal developmental stage that around the age of six or seven, children notice that they are different from other children and they pick out features of themselves that are distinct from others and they become aware of this and, you know, perhaps don't like that. And when she told me this, I, I found it an absolute revelation because my own children had gone through phases at around that age of disliking parts of their body and saying they didn't look like other children. Um, uh, and I've talked to other parents who say, oh, that happened to my kid as well. You know, in one case, it'd be a, a kid who said that their hair color was wrong, not like other children. In another case, it was a child who thought that their skin color was wrong, wasn't like other children. And just learning that that's a, a normal stage of child development to compare oneself to others at around six or seven, you know, helps as a parent you to understand, yeah, we don't need to change the kid's hair color or skin color or <laughs> whatever. We just need to say, yeah, that's right. You're different from others. That's how it is at this age. So that was a really long answer, I apologize, but your question was so rich. Uh, um, there are many, many things to do and it's much more than simply telling an individual person that you shouldn't change your body. It's a much broader question than that. So it's, it's not just about telling people that they need to develop a gr broader acceptance of their own body, but also, I mean, they need to drop, they, they need to stop participating, presumably, in the the kind of behavior that leads other people to question their bodies right so the for instance your children need to not only accept their differences but also um interact with their peers in ways that, that are that are less normative in that sense right this is this is this is right and i think this is probably one of the most difficult questions of the of well, of many aspects of thinking about how what our duties are in the context of you know widespread social injustice, right? which is the idea of social construction that we began our conversation with tells us that the way we act influences other people. right? What we do influences others because it reinforces or sets expectations about how we'll behave. It, you know, from a, in a very, very simple way. So you and I in this conversation, we are both adhering to all kinds of social norms just in our conversation you know we're both wearing clothes for example we're both <laughs> sat you know in a certain way we're not standing up and moving around we're not dancing while we're talking you know we're, we're adhering to various social conventions and you could I would, I would not judge you <laughs> <laughs> okay well it's so in simply adhering to these social conventions right we're reinforcing the idea that that's how to mm. behave so it's sort of tempting to say that we have a duty to others to resist let's say harmful body modifications so as to make it easier for those other people to resist too, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you do something wrong if you put your tie on or wear makeup or go to the gym because you're showing other people that's how you should act. Um, so it's really tempting to say that. Um, and I think there certainly are contexts in which we should be you know, incredibly mindful of the impact we have on others. So an, an influencer on social media, somebody who puts themselves out as an influencer, clearly has, I think, an obligation to be mindful of what they are influencing people to do. Mm -hmm. People in positions of of power or authority, parents, teachers, you know, have a particular kind of responsibility to think about the impact they're having on those they're responsible for. But it would be a, a, a you know, it would be an overreach to think that all of us have a duty to constrain our actions so that other people don't 
copy us, right? That would be a serious constraint on our liberty. We can't have that as a general requirement. Um, so that's why there has to be room for each of us to deal with our bodies in our own way, which may mean modifying them, which may mean adorning them, which may mean treating them as you know, canvases for our creativity, may mean choosing to change them in various ways. We each must have that freedom to do that to our own bodies um, without thinking that we have a duty to as well, set a good example to others. But we have to also recognise that there is that collective um, atmosphere that we're creating and contributing to and think about how collectively we can make that one that is more conducive to, to flourishing. Claire, thank you so much for joining me. Um, this book, Intact, I mean, it's... There's a lot of philosophy books out there that are tough to read, and uh, this one is just, it's just, I think, an example of fantastic philosophical writing, right? Because it's, it's, it's profound, and, but it's also, you know, it's, 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 it's a page turner. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. It was a <laughs> lot of fun. So, uh, so thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.